their sort of main role that's the, the kind of next big thing, as it, as it were, in, in the step in the steps of, of this becoming a kind of functioning regulation framework is preparing codes of practice, which will essentially set out the specifics of what platforms are required to do. And it will basically be a kind of comply or explain regime where either you do what it says in the code of practice or you don't. But if you don't, you have to tell them why what you're doing will protect people as effectively as, as what's written in the code of practice. I'm Quinta Jurassic. And this is the Lawfare Podcast, March 31st, 2022. Today, we're bringing you another episode of our Arbiters of Truth series on the online information ecosystem. This week, we're turning our attention to the United Kingdom, where the government has just introduced into Parliament a broad proposal for regulating the internet, the Online Safety Bill. The UK government has proclaimed that the bill represents, quote, new world first online safety laws, and that it includes, quote, tougher and quicker criminal sanctions for tech bosses. So what would it actually do? To answer this question, Evelyn Dueck and I spoke with Ellen Judson, a senior researcher at the Center for the Analysis of Social Media at Demos, a UK think tank. Ellen has been closely tracking the legislation as it's developed, and she helped walk us through the tangled system of regulations created by the bill. What new obligations does the online safety bill create? And what companies would those obligations apply to? Why is the answer to so many questions yet to be defined? And how much of the legislation is just punting the really difficult questions for another day? And what happens now that the bill has been formally introduced in Parliament? It's the Lawfare Podcast, March 31st. What's in the UK online safety bill? So, Ellen, we're talking to you today because a little over a week ago, the UK government formally introduced the long-heralded online safety bill to Parliament. The final document is a succinct 225 pages, and there's a lot in there, but maybe a place to start would be to talk about how we got here and what it means for the bill to be introduced into Parliament this way. So, you know, I've lost count of how many tech regulation bills have been introduced into US Congress in the past few years, and most of them we never hear about ever again beyond the initial press release. In this case, what's the history of the UK bill and what does that tell us about why it's something worth paying attention to? Absolutely. So where we started um, back in 2019 with the government publishing uh, online harms, as it was called then, uh, white paper, basically setting out the government's intention to bring in regulations to deal with online harms. The scope of that at the time was extremely broad. Um, sort of promising to tackle everything from illegal content online, uh, harassment and bullying online, disinformation and all of these various things. It was somewhat presented as this, you know, this is going to be the solution. This is how we take back power from big tech and and this is how we keep people safe. And I think that the stated ambition uh, was and, and still is to make the UK the safest place in the world to go online. We've had a long period of consultations. Uh, We've had parliamentary committees conducting scrutiny of the report, taking evidence from experts, from civil society, from tech companies. Uh, We've had a draft bill which went through um, all of these various processes. And finally, we've got the the actual bill that's, that's been presented to Parliament. What it looks like at the end of the parliamentary process is another question because we're going to see a lot of changes and a lot of amendments. So we still don't quite know what the the ultimate final version uh, will be. But I think the the main priorities have kind of stayed fairly consistent over the years, which is making social media platforms responsible for harms that are occurring uh, on their services and and to their users and to try and rebalance some of the, the power discrepancies that we see where Social media companies are kind of making making all of the decisions about what and how we we see things on on their services, and everyone else is kind of kept in the dark. And so, what is the existing architecture of internet regulation in the UK that this would be replacing or building on? Because, of course, I'm in the US right now. In the US, a lot of tech discourse sort of takes place on the background that there's essentially no regulation in this area. And the main provision of tech law, which is Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act, immunizes tech companies from a lot of obligations. So, where do things stand now in the UK? So it is pretty new in this, in a similar sense in that this is kind of the first time that the, the UK has tried something like this. And I think it's interesting to have seen it be developing at the same time as we've had, obviously, the Digital Services Act being developed in the in the EU and where there were kind of some 
some parallels uh, in, in how it's being thought about. Where it fits into other legislation is slightly well controversial and, and difficult to say because some of the crucial legislation that would be relevant to what platforms are doing, particularly around data privacy, is in the middle of being reformed. There's a whole package of kind of various leg- pieces of legislation which will affect various different bits of the tech industry. We've got AI strategies, we've got um, human rights legislation being reformed. And it's not quite clear how this is all going to crystallize yet into one coherent kind of regime that that deals with online regulation. So there's not much of a precedent for how we deal with these with these issues. And I'm not sure we know what the what the outcome is going to look like yet. Yeah, we suddenly seem to be at this inflection point globally where many countries are suddenly sort of waking up and and drafting all of these regulatory schemes. And it's going to be another thing to see how they all uh, interlock and interrelate as well. But let's let's stay focused on one. That's probably enough of a question for us today. So can you give us a bit of an idea of the overall scheme of the UK online safety bill and, and what it's trying to achieve? So, you know, in a lot of the press releases and things, the government has said these laws are not about imposing excessive regulation or state removal of content, but ensuring that companies have the systems and processes in place to ensure users' safety. So at a high level, what does that mean and what's the overall architecture here? So what that really means is that the government is not aiming to introduce essentially liability for individual pieces of content. Um, So if, for instance, one piece of illegal content isn't taken down by Facebook, that in itself will not constitute a breach of this of this regulation. The regulation is aiming much higher than that to look at, as you say, the systems and processes that platforms have in place to deal with harmful content and, and the associated risks. So the way that the bill is structured at the moment is it applies to quite a wide uh, range of online service providers, uh, primarily those who facilitate user to user content. So social media platforms are the, the kind of headline uh, versions of those and those with search engines uh, and any combination of the above. And there are various exemptions to to this, but those are the, those are the main ones. So we're thinking, you know, Facebook, Google, Twitter, these are the kind of big ones that are are going to be in the sites of, of this regulation. So essentially what the regulation does is to introduce uh, safety duties uh, onto these platforms and safety duties uh, fall into three main categories. And one is safety duties around illegal content. So that sets out that platforms will have to have uh, systems in place uh, for dealing with illegal content. And when it's in terms of illegal content, primarily that's going to be looking at how are you identifying it? How are you removing it? Do users have a way to report it if they come across it? And do you have complaints procedures in, in place for if you know something is mistakenly removed? And then there's uh, content which is legal, but is considered harmful to children, uh, which is, again, a very broad category that can kind of encompass things from uh, pornographic content through to bullying. And in these cases, uh, platforms will have to take steps essentially to reduce the risks of children encountering that content. Then on the the sort of the most controversial section uh, is probably the content that is harmful to adults. Uh, which essentially means content that is legal but but is harmful to adults. And that's where we see a lot of the conversations around disinformation, the conversations around some forms of, of abuse and, and harassment online. And these are duties that will only apply to a, a certain select few companies. We don't know which ones yet, but essentially we're assuming it's going to be the major big tech platforms that, that we all you know see in the news a, a lot. And they will have to essentially say in their terms of service how they're going to be dealing with with these various kinds of harmful content. And once they've said that, they're going to have to do what they've said on the tin uh, and actually enforce their terms of service consistently, uh, or else they'll be in, in scope of this regulation. So you mentioned that it's not quite clear which companies are, are going to have to do <laughs> what. And I think that's worth digging into because I will say, while reading up on the bill, I think I, I probably spent 15 or 20 minutes trying to figure out which companies were in which categories. There's category one, two A, and two B. And at the end of my 20 minutes trying to pin down what defines a category one company, the best I ended up with was a company that fits what are called the threshold conditions set for a category one company, which it's not clear to me whether those exist yet. So can you walk us through which companies are are in different categories and why those contours are so vague? So currently, as you say, the threshold conditions 
through which the which companies are in which categories uh, haven't been defined. Those are going to be set out later. So we really don't know uh, essentially uh, what the what the threshold is going to be. We do know that it's going to bear some relation to the size of the platform uh, and the functionalities of the platform. So what we're taking that to mean is essentially the large, the very very large social media platforms, perhaps that have certain content sharing or user communication functions that that are seem to be particularly high risk that we don't know. Those will be determined to be category one. Others will be determined uh, to be category two. Two A is the search services. So that's how they're, that's why the category two has, has split into those two. But as you say, the, the conditions, what the specific conditions are around what size, what functionalities, what other conditions, because there's also a clause that says there may be other conditions that apply. We don't know. And one of the big critiques that the bill has had you know, since since the draft bill came out, was that there's far too much focus on the size of a platform and not enough on the risk of a platform. So the regulation is really is meant to be about protecting users, is meant to be about promoting safety, but is seemingly making this distinction on the basis of sort of fairly neutral factors about size and functionality, which may certainly increase risk, but aren't necessarily equivalent to it. And we've seen a lot of Obviously, issues around uh, you know hate speech, extremism, uh, disinformation on many of the smaller platforms, and it's quite unclear how the risks on those platforms that will be expected to be dealt with if they're too small to to count as category one. Okay, so let's dig into the other categories that you're talking about, the different categories of of harm and content. Yeah, I, I do feel like that meme where there's, uh, you know, that guy standing in front of the string and the uh, different pictures um, when I was trying to go through this bill as well, because there's, you know, references back to this definition and that definition. So it's all a bit of a maze. I'm glad that you are here uh, <laughs> to help us um, walk through this. So let's go back to that sort of illegal, lawful, but harmful uh, kind of distinction. You know, the latter has attracted far more controversy, but n- neither are without difficulty. Can you explain the distinction and the tightrope that the bill is trying to walk in in drawing that distinction, whether it succeeds at all? So I think the the intention of the distinction is a recognition that we already have existing legislation about uh, what kinds of uh, speech, what kinds of activity online are legal or illegal. And there's general consensus that if there's some if something is illegal offline, then it should be illegal online. So having a regulation which you know, holds platforms accountable for if there's sort of mass illegal activity happening on their services and they know about it and they're not doing anything about it, it that feels like a, an area that a lot of people think that there should be more action uh, taken to deal with. The scope of the illegal content duties has changed, I think, since the last draft of the bill. So initially it was uh, focused very heavily on uh, terrorism and CSEA uh, as the, the duties where platforms would really have to have these kind of proactive duties to go and use, you know, technical means, use human moderation to find this content and take it down because it was clearly illegal, clearly very harmful. And so it just shouldn't be, shouldn't be available. What we've seen at the kind of shift on the illegal content duties is the expansion of what kinds of illegal activity fall within those duties. So there's now a list, a, a list of offences in the bill, which will be which will be included and which platforms will have that sort of proactive duty to not only take it down if somebody reports it to them, but to have systems in place that that means they're identifying it. And I think one of the one of the questions around that is how good are those systems going to be? Uh, what's what's the likely success rate and what's the likely error rate and how will the how will the regulator deal with with those kinds of issues? I think that on the uh, legal but harmful sort of clauses, I think those have come in from a kind of recognition that what we're seeing is that although there are some kinds of content which individually we don't consider harmful enough to, you know, pass a sort of individual criminal threshold that we think that that person should be um, prosecuted or, or anything for for that speech, in the context, what we've seen on many of these platforms is that the kind of scaling of, of this content and the amplification uh, of things like disinformation, things like abuse, is causing extremely significant harms to individuals, ex- causing extremely significant harms to kind of to society, public health, uh, safety. And I think what they're trying to do with that section is kind of navigate that path between not mandating you have to find this content and take it down, even though it's perfectly legal, but trying to hold platforms 
more accountable for doing what they say that they are going to do about these forms of content. So when you go onto a social media platform and they say, we do not tolerate, you know, coordinated inauthentic activity, or we do not tolerate uh, abuse of any kind. But then what you see is that you're confronted with all of this content that you didn't think was going to be there. You don't know how to report it. The platform doesn't listen to you when you complain about it. It's really trying to target those kinds of systems so that actually users can be kind of making choices about the, the platforms that they are operating in and where platforms are kind of knowingly using systems or, or making design decisions that are increasing risks, um, that they there's some mechanism and transparency to, to hold them accountable for those decisions. So I should mention, uh, you mentioned CSEA, which is the British acronym for what Americans tend to call CSAM, which is child sexual abuse material. I do want to dig in on the the lawful but harmful aspect. As an American, this kind of, you know, makes my my hair stand on end as someone who was, you know, <laughs> raised on the on the First Amendment. I'm curious what kind of safeguards the bill might have uh, to sort of prevent the government from just essentially, you know, trying to go around just criminalizing this kind of content. Um, is there any way to, you know, prevent the government from sort of essentially making it illegal to carry legal speech? So I think there's a there's a few things. I think firstly, the way that the the bill is drafted at the moment is very focused on platforms terms of service. So that it is leaving that discretion for platforms to say make their decisions about what kinds of legal speech they they carry or not, but then they have to uphold those rules. I mean I, I should say there is also a lot of debate in the UK about, you know, what that actually looks like in practice. And if Facebook actually said, yes, we allow all sorts, every single legal harmful speech you can imagine, we're not going to do anything about it. Would that actually satisfy a regulator, even if the the text of the, the legislation at this stage makes it seem like that, that would be a possibility. So there's still a bit of debate around that. So there are a few protections for freedom of expression in the bill. One is a sort of overarching duty. Uh, and that's a duty that platforms have to have regard to the importance of protecting freedom of expression under the law, which, as many people have said, (laughs) is very vague. And it's hard to know exactly what that looks like kind of operationally and how far that will be, you know, a sort of tick box. Platforms have said, yes, we've thought about this, so we've met this duty and how far it will be kind of outcomes based around if if there's been overreach or or over-moderation or anything. There's also... Two other protections, uh, which are specifically related to the, in the context of the the legal but harmful duties, uh, because those only apply to category one services. So they also have these these extra duties. Uh, And those are duties to protect journalistic content and content of democratic importance. And again, these aren't strict exemptions. These aren't, you, you can't take down this content, but it's that you have to have systems in place that are acknowledging the importance of, of these freedoms and you know have expedited complaints procedures in, in place for, for journalistic content if it's been taken down uh, in error and, and so forth. And I have to say these are two clauses that I'm quite concerned about. <laughs> Ironically, you know, as in terms of how well they're going to protect freedom of expression, I think they, they kind of risk doing the opposite because the definitions that they're relying on for what is journalistic content and what is democratically important content uh, seem to me to be either so broad as to not really add very much beyond the existing freedom of expression uh, duties or to actually potentially privilege certain forms of speech, um, such as, you know, clearly political speech. So democratic content at the moment is defined as content that is or appears to be specifically intended to contribute to an area of democratic political debate uh, within the United Kingdom which in my in my view could apply to pretty much anything <laughs> but if it's really intended to only apply to you know whatever we're counting as the most live political debates the last 10 topics debated in the house of commons counts as live political debate then we end up with this slightly weird privileging of perhaps speech of politicians who are almost always talking about live political debates um over sort of broader speech or speech about politics that's outside the uk or speech about politics um, people's, you know, experiences that that have political ramifications but may not be about a specific debate that it, that is occurring, and so I think that's one of the things that we are particularly worried about in, in terms of is it going to protect freedom freedom of expression or is it going to protect 
a lot of content which would count as harmful disinformation against terms of service and so forth, but might get a bit of a free pass if it can claim that it's politically relevant in some undefined way. Yeah, it, you were being so diplomatic about sort of an, an objective in describing the uh, the bill up until now. I'm glad to hear you sort of uh, get stuck in and editorialize. I think it's helpful. Um, but I certainly sort of really agree those sort of, especially those, you know, democratic and journalistic content provisions really sort of seem to be the epitome of like, oh, just take down the bad stuff and leave up the good stuff uh, and we'll decide in an ad hoc manner what that means. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks. Bye. Kind of um, attitude towards uh, what, what platforms would, would do, which, you know, does... I have some sympathy for them that that makes it uh, rather difficult. It's one of my favorite favorite bits actually is the they're called the user empowerment duties, which sounds very nice. I'm very pro user empowerment. Oh yeah, they sound lovely. I love those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they require platforms to have systems through which uh, adults can control the harmful content that they are exposed to online, which in the bill is very vague in the sort of press statements uh, beforehand was was talking about this, you know, legal but harmful filter that you just, you know, be able to turn turn the bad stuff on and off uh, as you as you wish. <laughs> exactly. It's uh, it's perfect. Something that I'm getting hum- hung up on as well is sort of the, the definitions of, of harms and risk of harms and risk assessments, because you talked a bit before about how it's really focused on terms of service of the various mm-hmm. platforms but these sort of seem to be more objective kinds of things like what are the risks of harm to society not like the risk to the effective enforcement of your terms of service if that makes sense and I'm, I'm curious how uh, like exactly what platforms are envisaged to have to as- assess there and if there is any objective way to do this because something I get hung up on in, in this context is like if there was an objective way of ascertaining the risk of harm to society from certain speech, I think a lot of speech regulation would be a lot easier, like just in general, (laughs) not even in this context, but government regulation as well. Like if you could say, oh, this kind of speech causes this kind of harm, uh, that's a pretty good case to regulate that kind of speech. But it's one of the things that we've sort of struggled with as a society is to know uh, how speech causes harm in any kind of uh, real objective way. And it's something we contest a lot and continually. So what is the bill asking platforms to do there and um, how are they supposed to do it? So there's a few different things. I think uh, the first one to sound like a bit of a broken record is we don't know yet because they haven't said in the bill. (laughs) And this is one of the kind of key areas of uncertainty right now is which kinds of harm platforms are going to be required to act on is yet to be yet to be determined. There's different kinds of uh, requirements that they have for whether a harm is a priority harm, whether it's a primary priority harm. But the list of, of what we're thinking is a priority harm, what makes it on, what doesn't make it on, how the, the, those boundaries are being defined, we haven't seen yet because it's it's coming later on. And I think that's one of the the challenges of being able to work out, as you say, if this bill is going to be effective or um, effective is going to lead to overreach, is going to lead to underreach because we're not quite sure what's in scope. They do have a, a sort of understanding of harm uh, that's specified to be talking about physical or psychological harm and talking about harm to individuals as opposed to so sort of general social societal harm uh, is not in scope, uh, which a lot of people have raised concerns about, particularly with things like disinformation threatening, say, uh, the integrity of election processes. That wouldn't count as harmful under this bill because it's not about kind of particular harm to an individual, but it's about kind of general, you know, threatening uh, of, of other sorts of harm. So in terms of the risk assessment duties that platforms have, it's basically going to be a risk to assess against specific harms, uh, which the, you know, are the ones we don't know what they are yet, but will be things like, say, harassment or abuse or, you know, particular kinds of illegal, illegal harms. And against those harms, essentially do a review of how the systems that they have in place are increasing risks to users or decreasing risks to users. And that's a fairly broad kind of understanding of what elements of of the platform they need to be looking at. Uh, So it includes content moderation systems. It includes content curation systems. uh, It includes terms of service. It includes the functionalities that are offered to users, the way that users can communicate, uh, the way that users use the service. Uh, The business model is even mentioned in the bill, though only briefly, how users are supported, the complaints procedures. So it's fairly kind of complex <laughs> the the diversity of, of areas that platforms are going to be expected to, to do these 
our risk assessments across. And then they have to present essentially to the regulator a kind of plan for uh, how they're going to, to mitigate those risks. I think one of the big questions is around kind of audit and how if a platform presents a risk assessment and says, this is the, the risk of harm we think we've got and this is how we're dealing with it, how exactly that's going to be tested to see if it if the risk assessment stands up, if the things that they're using to tackle those risks actually reduces the risk. But I think the the sort of key point of the, the regulation that I think makes it less of a somewhat less of a worry of of this is just going to end up being speech criminalization, you know, by by proxy, is that platforms are meant to be specifically looking at the things that they are responsible for that increase or reduce risks. So it's thinking about, I mean, we were thinking about, you know, the, the revelations we saw uh, from the Facebook files and things like that, where Facebook was carrying out these tests on, on certain kind of content curation algorithms. And they tried in changing from an engagement metric to a metric that they thought might reduce the risk of certain harms. And it did, but then their engagement went down. So they decided not to do that. And I think that's the, that's the sort of thing that I would really hope this regulation would have in scope that if platforms are carrying out these tests and are, or if, you know, with more data access, uh, independent researchers are, are able to sort of carry out tests and find that certain functionalities increase risks or, you know, whether it's behavioral nudges or whether it's, you know, does labeling content help people to navigate disinformation? You know, there's a lot of different views, but being able to have a sort of framework within which those things can be tested can be looked at I don't think it'll be perfect but I think it at least having that kind of transparency and a bit more oversight will be an improvement to where we are now so let's talk about the proactive technology requirements set out in the bill I think there's often a lot of kind of magical thinking about what these systems can do and regulators often fall into what I think is a, a trap of sort of passing laws that are, are essentially saying you know nerd harder and you'll be able to figure it out and there's been also a lot of civil society effort over the years into trying to educate lawmakers about why that is maybe not so easy uh, and why the costs of mandating automated takedowns, for example, will often fall on the most vulnerable users. So I'm curious whether the, the UK government has heeded any of these warnings in designing the bill. So I think there's a few different elements of the, the proactive requirements. I think the, the main one is the duties around illegal content, which essentially say that platforms have to have a service and they have to use proportionate systems and processes, proportionate as yet to be defined, uh, designed to minimize essentially how much illegal content there is on the service, minimize how long it's around for, uh, how much it gets shared and be able to take it down if it's if it's reported. So on the one hand, there's a there's sort of a lot of work that that, that section could be doing or, or could not be doing. And in one sort of outcome, we could see that that would lead to sort of very strong proactive monitoring. You know, if you're going to minimize the presence, then you have to just take down anything which remotely could possibly be illegal until you've definitely confirmed that it's not, which exactly, you know, runs into the, the issues that, that you were mentioning. It is possible that the deliberate use of the, you know, things about talking about proportionality is aimed to try and mitigate that, but I'm wary, uh, certainly, of, of kind of how that's going to be used in practice. And then the other bit, which is also worrying, is the specific uh, requirements about use of, quotes, proactive technologies. And this is essentially when a company has failed to fail to meet its duties. You know, there have been various routes of, of they, they've been informed that they failed and they haven't made any changes or improved things and so forth. The regulator can require them to use proactive technologies, which is uh, defined as, as falling into the categories of content moderation, uh, user profiling, or behavioral identification. So it's a pretty broad, uh, broad range, but that they can require to, to use those technologies in order to meet their safety duties. And I think that's one of the, yeah, more worrying elements uh, of the bill in that it does sound a little bit like, well, if you're not doing it, we'll, we'll just tell you that you have to use this tech and this tech will fix the problem. And I think specifically, there's been a lot of worries raised that, that, that I share around what this means for things like end-to-end -end encrypted channels. Uh, and the proactive technology 
uses, for instance, are restricted to, you can only be required to use them on public channels rather than private channels, though what we're counting as a private channel, again, we haven't had a, a super clear definition on. Uh, but these other uh, sort of broad, you can still be required to use certain technologies to detect the sort of very serious illegal harms on all channels. And although encryption isn't really discussed in the bill, given the kind of general opposition to end-to-end encryption, the use, the use of it that we've seen from the UK government, it's a worrying element that, that means potentially these kind of safety safety duties could be could be put in place. And then if platforms say, well, our channels are, are end-to-end encrypted, so we can't use that technology or we can use it, but it won't do anything, then they might be told, well, then, you know, you have to you have to make it work. You have to find a way to you know remove end-to-end encryption or compromise the integrity of it in some way, because we've said that you have to use this specific technology. And that's one of the real, yeah, real worries about, I guess, the kind of level of, of uh, vagueness that there is at the moment is that it could all be interpreted in a very, very sensible and, you know, rights respecting ways, or it could not be. And it's not easy to tell uh, at the moment which way the the wind of that is blowing. Yeah, I don't think we have to worry, though, because I remember reading in a press release or at some point throughout the last bit of this process, I don't know if this made it into the bill, but that they would only require highly accurate, proactive technology. Oh, oh, that's good. That's all right. (laughs) Yeah, no, which just feels uh, much, much better. Uh, Yet to be defined, of course, which I feel like it should become a drinking game for this episode. (laughs) Uh, Yet to be defined, uh, drink. Um, And and so that's not a bad segue, actually, to the next question, which was about Ofcom the administrative agency which will be charged with implementing a lot of this uh, regulatory scheme and doing some of that yet to be defined work. Um, So it's a short, I believe, for the Office of Communications. Uh, Could you tell us a bit about its role in the scheme, but also a little bit about it as a whole in terms of like, how politicized is it? Is this something that, you know, is really uh, answers to the executive of the day? Like, who is it made up of? And what's its record on regulation of communications more generally? So absolutely, Ofcom is the the communications regulator, sort of writ large, so that at the moment, the sort of big focus is kind of broadcast uh, regulation. There also includes things like postal regulation, basically anything, anything communications wise, which now is coming to mean uh, the internet, and I think I think this is a big shift in terms of the scale of the challenge. Regulating the postal service and regulating the whole of the internet are slightly different challenges. And I think there is, I mean, there's there's some stuff in the bill about how Ofcom will be resourced to you know to, to deal with this, and path platforms will have to pay certain fees in order to enable uh, Ofcom to have the resource. Their role essentially is going to be running the regulatory regime, so they'll be producing their own risk assessments. Um, they'll be carrying out audits and, and requiring information from platforms and producing transparency reports on what's going on and you know doing doing the day-to-day running. Their sort of main role that's the the kind of next big thing as it as it were in, in the step in the steps of, of this becoming a kind of functioning regulation framework is preparing codes of practice, which will essentially set out the specifics of what platforms are required to do. And it will basically be a kind of comply or explain regime where either you do what it says in the code of practice or you don't but if you don't you have to tell them why what you're doing will protect people as effectively as as what's written in the code of practice and the codes of practice themselves there's lots of requirements about how how often we'll have to consult with various bodies one of the the big worries i think at the moment is how much power the government is retaining to tell ofcom what to do and i think you know having Having a framework where you know the initial priorities are, are set set by Parliament, and then we have this independent regulator who who is delivering the regulation. That model makes makes a lot of sense to me. But the, there's a a lot of different sort of ways that the Secretary of State can direct Ofcom to make changes to the codes of practice and make changes to um, the sort of strategic priorities it follows. Make changes to the way that the um, the regulation is carried out. And there's lots of you know different cases in which that could happen and sometimes they'll have to say why but then sometimes they won't have to say why and that's sort of an unusual point that that's been the sort of one consensus point across kind of UK civil society really and there's been lots of divided opinions on the bill some people think it's great some people think it's terrible some people think it's both 
but that's been the kind of one rallying cry from across the board is that the Secretary of State powers are too strong because it would give the government, uh, I think in the first draft, they said that Ofcom could be directed to, to change codes of practice in line with government public policy. And now they've changed it to public policy, which sounds to me like pretty much the same thing. Right. I mean, one one answer to what is public policy is policy set by the government. So I don't <laughs> I don't know how, how much yes. different that really is. I do think that the the code of practice issue here is interesting and maybe speaks to uh, how we've been joking about how so much of what we've been talking about is sort of yet to be defined. I mean, it it seems like a lot of what's in the spill is just kind of kicking the can down the road, throwing out a bunch of vague mm-hmm. terms like harm and democratic importance and letting someone else, in, in many cases Ofcom, kind of deal with hashing out the specifics. So I'm curious you know, what's the advantage of going through this route? Is the idea that it's more adaptable or changeable than actually passing a law? Is it that because defining these terms is actually really hard and so it's a lot easier for parliament to kind of say, let's just let these guys do it. Let's let them do it, you know, without having to do so in front of the public. They can hash it out in, you know, a smoke-filled room. It will be easier. What do you think is going on there? So I think it is partly about being being flexible and being able, I think future proofing is a really big issue with with whether this regulation can get it right or not. You know, if, if and I think a lot of the discourse we've seen around it has been very much how is this going to tackle this bad thing that I saw on Facebook? Which you know, does it does it apply to the major platform that's around in five years, ten years? You know, we, we don't know. So I think I think there is an advantage in in keeping it a higher level for that reason. I think my my optimistic hat for why the the vagueness is is helpful in some ways is because what i would hope to see would be kind of requirements on platforms and risk assessments being extremely specific to the actual level of risk and i think that's the only way that we kind of avoid as you say kind of extreme overreach and over moderation is platforms should be required to do things that will actually reduce the risk of a specific harm on their platform rather than just required to do something that sounds like it would maybe reduce some kind of risk of something. And I think there is things like the the user empowerment duties that I mentioned earlier is is a more kind of spe- more specific duty than some of the other broader safety duties and it has a little bit of that flavor about it of it sounds like a thing that would probably be good in theory but how that translates into okay so what actually do you want Twitter to do tomorrow to implement that? <laughs> and what will they be judged against? And what outcomes do you want? And I just, I don't think for something of, of this scale that's going to cover so many platforms, you could ever have all of that specificity up front in the bill itself. And, and so I, I think there, I think there is an argument for having it, having it further down the road um, to enable that kind of tailoring to levels of risk. And, you know, then if the risks change, you can change your requirements and maybe suddenly the platform is much safer and, you know, they don't have to do so much or the platform gets much worse and they have to do a bit more. But I think that the sort of, yeah, obviously the the flip side of that is at the moment, you know, in this slightly odd position of um, parliamentarians will be, will be having to debate on and vote on uh, a bill where the answer to what will platforms be required to do is, is not in the bill because it's going to be in the codes of practice and we haven't got those yet. So we wanted to ask about the sort of political dynamics uh, of who's supporting and critiquing the bill and what the critiques are. But before we get to that, are there any other provisions in the bill that are important that you want to make sure our listeners know about? Yeah, so I think the the other kind of big element is how the bill deals with privacy. And I think that's that's another one of of our particular areas of interest, because we see a sort of similar framework to the, the freedom of expression duty and that um, platforms will have a duty to have regard to the importance of protecting privacy, uh, though only in the, when they are doing things under this particular uh, safety regime. So if they are introducing a new system to comply with their safety duties, they should think about privacy at some point. But if they're just making another decision, then, well, they don't have to, or they only have to as far as the other existing privacy regulations go. But I think one of the things that this is kind of particularly important around is there are a lot of requirements in the bill which either explicitly or implicitly require some kind of 
age verification, age assurance, identity verification systems to be in place. And some of that is to protect children from certain kinds of harmful content. Uh, Some of that is to give people the option to verify their identities online so that other people can then, for instance, block interactions with people who haven't verified their identity uh, if they're worried about anonymous abuse. And then obviously, you know, there's the things we discussed around the kind of proactive proactive technologies and, and how monitoring expectations will be will be met. So it feels like there is a a bit of a, a imbalance on the scales of there's a lot in the bill that could have very significant ramifications for user privacy. And then we've got a kind of slightly vague, not very clear, but you should have a duty to have the regard to the importance of uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, a big concern, I think, is is how far privacy might end up sort of being sidelined, uh, especially since so many of the discussions do focus very much on this this freedom of expression question that privacy maybe just gets kind of a bit more forgotten about. Great. So I want to talk a little bit about the reactions to the bill and, and how it's been received from where I'm sitting, which, you know, is an ocean away, so <laughs> is, is surely going to be missing quite a lot. I think there's sort of, I've sort of seen three broad reactions, I would say, is the first being something like the, the political coalition for it and the what you think of the children kind of crowd, which think that, you know, this is really great and important and the tech platforms are kind of evil. And, and the fact that this includes, you know, threats of jail terms for executives is really just the cherry on top this is great. Then I think there's, you know, the libertarian group roughly that sort of thinks that anything that is regulating these speech platforms is sort of a risk to freedom of expression. And there's sort of no way to do this in a way that doesn't risk that and isn't too costly to free speech. Um, And that camp's obviously pretty anti this bill. But then there's, I think, a, a camp, and this is probably loosely where I would situate myself, which is something like, you know, these are really powerful companies. And of course, course, the government should be really careful about how it, it thinks about regulating them because of the risks to free speech. But it's also kind of untenable <laughs> that they should be operating um, and doing so much, have so much power over the public sphere in a completely unaccountable way. You know, we just don't have any idea whether these terms of service are being implemented, whether they're even thinking about sort of the, the harms or they don't even have uh, any obligation to think about those harms. And the idea of a systemic approach as opposed to punishing individual, you know, mistakes feels like a a good approach. It's an approach I've advocated for uh, in places in my own work as important. But, you know, there's a lot of flaws with the way that this particular bill goes about. Some of them known and many of them we've talked about and some of them unknown because of the yet to be defined problem um, where, you know, parts of them, uh, parts of it could be really good or could be uh, really problematic. I'm curious, you know, what you think of that categorization of the reactions, whether I'm missing anything about the politics of this bill in the UK and your dominant reaction to this bill, what you think of it? Yeah, so I think it's an it's an interesting one because it's a bill on which there is pretty strong cross-party support that there should be regulation. So, so that, that uh, element kind of between the political parties isn't much debated. It's more where the, the debate comes down is around the details of, of is this going too far around freedom of, you know, threatening freedom of expression? Is this not going far enough to protect people? But, you know, we've seen the, seen the opposition party saying we want to see this bill brought in quickly. You know, it, it's it's not like some of the other legislation where it's just very, you know, party political divides. It's it's a bit more kind of across the board than that. In terms of the sort of, yes, yeah, civil society groups, I think I think broadly that's, that's right. There's groups who think that the bill needs to go much further uh, and doesn't, isn't, strong enough uh, and isn't going to be holding platforms to account properly is just going to turn into a sort of tick box exercise where you know platforms fill in a transparency report once a year and get a get a pat on the head from from the regulator and then everything just carries on as normal other people who think that yeah absolutely as you said that that this bill is essentially you know 1984 here we come uh we won't be able to say anything legal online it's going to be taken down by by platforms i think yeah, I also am very much in that the the middle camp of I think the the risks of bad regulation are very very high, but the risks of no regulation are also very very high, and it feels like we've sort of tried the no regulation version for for a little while now, and it hasn't hasn't turned out too well. So I've always been yes yeah, supportive of the the principle of the of the regulation that it seems yeah bizarre to me that that 
there are these platforms that are controlling so much of you know our, our information environment and how we communicate with each other and how political discourse happens and how people understand what's going on and we've had all of these kind of global catastrophes that we've had to contend with from which obviously you know we've seen the kind of effects of, of how how things are, are amplified or, or made worse by by what's happening what's happening online and I think at a, at a minimum regulation that can try and bring a bit more kind of democratic oversight to those processes and to what's going on uh, is a good thing but I I definitely share a lot of the concerns actually on both sides I share concerns that in some places I don't think the bill is goes far enough disinformation is one of them because I think there's essentially a lot of protections that can be used to protect disinformation and not a lot of duties to do much about it and then on the flip side of that I think there are areas where the bill goes much too far <laughs> and uh, yeah really does risk kind of encroaching on on user rights but as as we've said it's it's so difficult at this stage to really kind of make a considered like all things considered is the bill going to be good or bad because so much depends on what happens in six months in 12 months in two years which is a slightly scary position to be in because it's a sort of um you know we have to have to wait until the thing's already passed uh and then once it's passed then you know we have to work out whether it's going to work or not but yeah it feels like a, a situation sort of not a, not enough information so cautiously optimistic is how i uh well, describe myself about it, I think about a year ago. I think since then I've become more on the cautious and less on the optimistic side. I think it, it might also be helpful talking about, you know, where support for the bill comes from and and who the opponents are to, to kind of step back for a moment and situate this in the broader political and social context of the politics of this in the UK. Unfortunately, in the US, the debate around these issues is has become extremely polarized. Uh, generally speaking, the left wants platforms to take more content down. The right wants them to stop taking content down. What are the political dynamics of this debate in the UK? And how does this sort of fit into the broader discourse around free speech, human rights, you know, the role of the internet in society? So in many ways, I think that this bill has been quite a surprise because it has seemed a little bit out of out of step with some of the other ways that free speech is is talked about in the in the UK from well from the from the government particularly in that free speech has been a very polarizing issue for for a good few years um, and there have been a lot of controversies about uh, universities particularly around you know issues about people being deplatformed and we've seen the government saying, you know, this is this is a, a war on free speech. We have to we have to stop the the woke campaigners from from taking over and uh, you know silencing people. And we're going to bring in regulation to ensure that universities have to protect freedom of expression in in all of these various ways. And just this week, actually, we've seen in the kind of human rights as we're in the process of reforming human rights legislation. And they've expressed this an intention to have freedom of expression as a as a legal trump card to sort of be elevated so that considerations of uh, privacy or harm or um, discrimination or, you know, whatever freedom of expression is kind of the the thing to aim for. And I think I think I'm I'm more worried about the uh, clauses in this bill which seek to protect freedom of expression because. I mean, in, in specifically the democratic content and the, the journalistic protections, because while they sound that the sort of thing that, again, sounds very theoretically sensible. And, you know, why would you not want to, you know, why would why would I not want to protect democratic speech and, and journalism, all of these good things? But taken within a context where free speech is being given this sort of weird primacy above above anything else. And there's this kind of figure phantom figure of of you know people who who are speaking out against harm they've experienced speaking out against marginalization and they're being portrayed they're being portrayed as the threat to free speech rather than you know corporations governments all of these all of these institutions that have so much more power over over who gets to speak and whose speech is heard and whose speech is listened to we've ended up in this weird situation in the UK where it's it's for the people who are who are facing a lot of discrimination and marginalization are suddenly being portrayed as as that threat to free speech which i think is is really worrying and so i think yeah seeing seeing the bill within that context it's a quite interesting that they've 
they're going ahead with it because obviously it has had so much criticism from freedom of expression groups um and with its heavy emphasis on we have to protect people you know safety is extremely important feels like a bit of a tension with the but also freedom of expression is the most important thing but i i yeah i do worry about the how it will be implemented in practice and if that will if that will mean that there are cases where what would count as you know harmful speech that should be taken down that it's abusive it's harassing it's um discriminatory that there will be oh but oh but you know this is this is just free speech that we we have to protect and what the bill has actually been described in some places by by the government as it will protect free speech better online because it will stop platforms taking things down when they face pressure from these quotes woke campaigners to take things down so really in this vision which i don't think is true or real but in this vision platforms are just taking down loads and loads of entirely legitimate expression because of pressure they're facing from campaigners and this bill will give the power give the power back to the platforms to stand up for freedom of expression which all seems very backwards to me but that's the that's the context it's operating in I love that. Uh, free speech should be a, a trump card. It's it's not like there are any examples that come to mind where that kind of rhetoric has led to unproductive and reductionist discourse and, and material harms, none none whatsoever. Um, completely unrelatedly, uh, a bill like this would be subject to a First Amendment challenge within about 30 seconds uh, in the US. And, you know, indeed, I, I'm sure that there is a challenge already written and sitting in a drawer in Palo Alto somewhere for just in case uh, any legislation ever makes it through the hamstrung Congress here. Um, and there's also a, a robust civil society here that, that brings challenges to, to legislation like this. And, and you know, with the First Amendment, any of those challenges would have a, a pretty good chance of succeeding. So I'm curious about the dynamics around that in the UK, whether you think, because, you know, these have some pretty substantial obligations for platforms. And, you know, there, there are those provisions in there that, that threaten executives with jail terms will there be challenges to this kind of regulation this this bill in particular if it does pass and what's the framework for for evaluating those like it, what's the kind of level of success that you would think a bill like that might have under the sort of human rights framework over there i think it's yeah very would be very likely that there would be some kind of challenge i think the difficulty part of the difficulty of the the human rights framework at the moment is as I said, that it's being, because it's being redone. There's also been a lot of emphasis on the government, from the government on taking power back from European courts uh, or, you know, even taking, you know, adjusting how far UK courts have discretion to make the certain decisions because essentially that power should be in the hands of the government. And so to a certain degree, it feels a little bit like a sequencing question of whether challenges to the bill would come in before or after human rights uh, legislation has been rewritten. Because I think if it is rewritten in, in the way that's proposed, challenges to, well, not just to kind of the bill, but challenges to a lot of things will be a lot more difficult. And so I think it's, yeah, it's a kind of wait and see, but again, with more caution than optimism. So what is the process from here out? I mean, how, how likely is the bill to be passed? And if it is, when would it start taking effect? Is this something that we're likely to see, you know, immediate impacts or material impacts on company operations anytime soon? So the, the kind of next stage really for the bill is to go through the kind of parliamentary process of debate, of adding amendments. So as I say, the shape of the bill could change, though I wouldn't expect the kind of fundamental structure to change. It'd be more likely that sort of small things that would be added or, or taken away. I think it is likely to pass because of the cross-party support that, that there is for it. And I think also because of the way that it's framed as this is the online safety bill to protect people online, to make them safer. It's very politically difficult to say that you don't want that to happen as a, as a politician. So I would imagine that it would pass, but it's doubtful that it would be anytime soon. You know, we're thinking maybe sometime this year, next year. But even once it's passed, then there has to be the whole setup development of codes of practice and so on and so forth. So there's a bit of a tension between how long that process is going to take and 
how how soon platforms are going to be expected to be doing things because one of the changes they made um, between the, the draft bill and this version was shortening the that period of time after which uh, the, the sort of company execs could be could be held accountable for for failures because the and the rhetoric was all you know this we're going to compel action straight away you know they'll have to get their house in order but how they're meant to be doing that if you know the code of practice hasn't even been written yet they haven't quite said how that's going to happen uh so i would expect platforms to start making changes i mean in anticipation of it even just because you know they've got a, <laughs> a lot to do and i could could see how it would be an advantage to try and get get ahead of the curve but i wouldn't expect a sort of the fully fully fledged framework to be up and running and it'd be very clear how it's working and if it's going well for a few years at least well, we will keep our eyes peeled. Ellen, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to Arbiters of Truth, the Lawfare podcast series on our online information ecosystem. You can find past episodes in the Lawfare podcast feed and in our separate Arbiters of Truth podcast feed. And we'll be back with another episode next Thursday. The Lawfare podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter at patreon.com backslash lawfare, while you'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you listen to your podcasts and look out for our other shows, including Rational Security, Chatter, and our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th, titled The Aftermath. You can check out our written work at lawfareblog.com and buy Lawfare swag at thelawfarestore.com. This podcast is produced by Jen Pacha Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Hamza Shitu of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thanks for listening. <laughs>